that. Alright, we're rolling. Ladies and gentlemen, girls and girls, today let's talk about the Triumph Daytona and how it fares in 2024. This is my bike. It's a 2011 Triumph Daytona and well there's nothing like really special about Daytona if you compare it to other 600cc bike. Now Triumph did release this bike in 2006 as an answer to the uh, Japanese Super Sport 600cc class like the R6, the ZX6R and the CBR 600RR. Now for a bike that was released in 2006, this is still absolutely stunning. I don't know if this captures well or if the camera do it justice but to me it's still absolutely stunning. Now it does feature a undertail exhaust. And the tail exhaust, and uh, special part about this bike is that it's an inline three. You can see the headers; it's an inline three, 675 cc inline three. So let's talk about the goods and the bads in 2024. If you were you or someone you know were to buy a Daytona 675, all right, let's go. Let's go right. First, let's talk about the bad part of owning a Daytona. First of all, I would have to say it's the heat. I am feeling it right now. After about 20 minutes of riding, it gets really, really hot. Because of the uh, open fairing design on the side and the uh, undertail exhaust right under your right cheeks, it gets really hot there. But the, not only is it an annoyance to you, the rider, it's also not good for the bike. The heat causes the stator, the alternator, to die. It causes it to die earlier, more often. And it also damages your gaskets. The gaskets cannot, or sometimes they're, they're old, they're worn. They cannot hold the heat as, as a good as a new gasket, right? So it causes you to get oil leak. You're, you're more susceptible to getting oil leaks, basically, what I'm trying to say. So, Obviously, it's not as hot as something like a Ducati V4 or uh, RS V4. The V4 engines get notoriously hot, but from my experience, it is uh, hotter than uh, V2 engines. Secondly, I want to address the... If you know anything about Triumphs or Daytona in particular, they have a reputation for being unreliable. Uh, personally, on this bike, there is one thing that's really unreliable and it's, it's going to be your uh, charging system meaning your your uh, stator or you can call it an alternator and your r and r your rectifier and regulator those two will die on you at some point if you buy one of these now there are steps that you can take to mitigate it so it, it breaks less often but it's a it's just something you have to accept. It's like a, basically at this point, it's a maintenance. It's basic maintenance. You gotta change it at least once a year. A bad regulator will destroy your stator, your alternator, your battery, and your wiring. Those are something to keep in mind. But um, specifically, alternators, I have changed two. I've owned this bike for eight months. The first time it broke, I just rewrapped it. It's like a temporary fix. And I currently have a, a rig motor aftermarket uh, alternator in it. And it runs just fine. So I'll keep you guys updated on how long that lasts. And other unreliability concerns are probably, the, the major ones are probably um, electricals. This being a 2006 example, or 2011 example, uh, my wiring harness has been tampered with before, the wiring stuff. So I've had some problems uh, with that. But 
if you are able to find a Daytona that's completely not untouched in terms of uh, wiring, you'll probably be set. It's not a big issue. Actually, <laughs> the funny story is this one in specifically actually had a blown motor. Uh, the the old owner had had bought this bike, imported it from Japan. He rode it, and the the original engine blew up. So he changed the engine. He changed the engine. He imported an engine from Japan and changed the engine. So I bought it knowing that the engine is new, and that's one of the reasons I bought it because the engine is new. It doesn't have any uh, weird ticking noise that it shouldn't have, and it does not have a cam chain noise. Reliability, I would probably give it like a 6 out of 10. I don't know, it's, it's not amazing, but it's not that bad either. You'll deal with it because this bag is amazing. So if you're not ready to put up a fight or you don't want any headaches at all, don't get a Daytona, man. It will give you some headaches sometime or lack thereof, there, there is no tech on this bike. This bike from 2006 to 2012, there is absolutely no tech. No slipper clutch, no ABS, no traction control, no mode, nothing. Just engine and you. Engine and monkey. So it's just you and the bike, which is uh, actually preferable for some people. There is no creature comfort. Uh, this is not a comfortable bike. And although I do want slipper clutch, and it is like a mod that you can add on to from aftermarket uh, clutch set, but that will cost you like uh, probably 2k, 3k, something like that. But I'm happy with the way it is. It's just you and the bike, and the power is not is not crazy if you know what you're doing. So I think it's a good option, especially because uh, of how how people perceive it to be you know unreliable so the, the price is like not that good on the market something like an R6 is really overrated it's really expensive where you can get a Daytona it'll leave you stranded sometime but it's a good price it's a good bike all right the, the world is finally open you can now uh, rip it a bit Did you hear that inline 3 motor? Oh yeah, one more thing I want to mention before we end uh, the bad part and talk about the good part is uh, part scarcity. OEM oh, yeah, parts are very hard to come by if you're outside of Europe and America. So if you ride a Triumph anywhere else, it's pretty hard to come by and when you do come by them, they're expensive because you have to import them from Europe or America. So, as you can see here, I have a lot of aftermarket parts because uh, I broke the OEM parts and I could not find a replacement. Like this gas cap, that's aftermarket. Clip-ons, aftermarket. Dampener, aftermarket. So, now that we're done with the bad parts, let's talk about the good parts. First of all, it looks amazing. I'm sure you've seen it. I'm sure you've heard it. It looks amazing, sounds amazing, and rides amazing. It's very torquey. The power band, even though the horsepower is the same as an R6, the power band is down low to mid-range. Whereas the R6, it's a mm, higher mid-end to high-end. So on an R6, if, if you've ever ridden one, you would know that at 8K, that's when the power band kicks in. From 0 to 8K, it's like riding a 250. It's, it's just almost fall over slow. So the good thing about on the Daytona is that the power band is basically from here to 10k. Anything over 10k, it kind of starts to wean off and get really slow. So it's really talking down low to mid range. That's where the power band is at. We can talk about this a little bit more. This is 
the good thing about this bike is it looks nice. Even in 2024, the design still holds up very well. It's still very aerodynamic. It looks very aggressive. And something that's kind of rare nowadays is the uh, undertail exhaust, right? Only the CVR still has it. 600RR, the 1000 stopped having it a long time ago. And I don't know, something about the Europeanness of it. It's European heritage. The, you know, exposed tubular uh, frame. And also, it's really easy to work on. I've worked on it, I've taken off the fairing many times. And the fairing is held on by like five bolts on this side, five bolts on the other side, four on the back, and like three on the tank. It's really, really easy to work on. So, should you get a Triumph Daytona in 2024? My answer would be yes. But only if you had experience working on bikes, if you want to work on bikes, or want to work on your bike specifically. Because it, it will require some love and affection from you, the rider. It's a, I guess you can say it's a high maintenance bike. It's not as high as something like Ducati's. But it will ha require higher level of maintenance than Japanese bikes. Overall, it's an amazing bike and please do get one if you had the chance. It's awesome. Alright, thank you guys. See you guys later. Ooh la la, it sounds good. Hello, sir.